Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Valentine's Day version of the uh, Regional Transportation Committee for, under the Denver Regional Council of Governments. My name is Kevin Flynn. I will be chairing this meeting until about 9.15 when I need to leave for another meeting. And uh, Vice Chair Conklin will take over. I wanted to announce that we have two new members uh, representing CDOT, and they are Darius Pakbaz, wave again, <laughs> and uh, Keith Stefanik, who I don't see here, uh, but uh, I don't know if he's watching online. But welcome, Keith. Uh, public comment, Cam, do we have anyone in the queue for public comment? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't see any hands raised at this time, but let me a second. Yeah, I don't see any, Mr. Chair. Very good. Okay, uh, the next item is our January 17th RTC meeting summary. Uh, they went, this went out a week ago. If anyone has reviewed it and has any comments or corrections, please say so. If not, we will... I regard them as accepted. Uh, next item is action item number four, transportation improvement program amendments. Uh, Josh Schwenk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me pull this up for you. Um, so we do have six proposed amendments to the transportation improvement program for you this morning. Uh, the first two are uh, changes to formula funds that RTD receives from the Federal Transit Administration. FTA has uh, revised the amounts that are available, so it's just to add that additional funding into those projects in the TIP. Next, uh, we have a change to the I-270 corridor improvements project, which would add uh, state faster bridge funding for uh, bridge design along that corridor. Next, uh, we have a change to the State Highway 7 and 95th Street intersection project. This is just a one-for-one -one swap of funding uh, between regional priority project funding and state legislative funding. Next, we have the creation of a new pool for uh, Vision Zero safety projects within CDOT Region 1. And finally, uh, we have the I-25 Segment 5 project. This was previously listed in the RPP pool, but we're breaking that out as its own project in the TIP. Uh, with state legislative funding. So with that, happy to take any questions on any of those. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available for you uh, on your screen as well as in your packets. Thank you, Josh. Um, it's always nice to see uh, amendments to bring in new money. Uh, do we have any discussion on any of these? If not, would someone like to make a motion? Don't rush. Am I on? Director Williams. Hi, I, I move to recommend to the Board of Directors the attached project amendments to the 2022-2025 TIP. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Stanton. Very appropriate that RTD make that motion because of, that's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Say no. Seeing none, are there any abstentions? All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the uh, Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Strategic Plan. We had a, a presentation on this uh, at the last month's meeting. Uh, Greg McKinnon. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, it was. We were here last month uh, for an informational uh, session, uh, and this time we're, uh, we're looking for action. Uh, but we're going to start with some media coverage. Uh, what, what we have is a, uh, a project in Castle Rock that uh, um, uh, is funded through the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Program, and uh, we've got some uh, positive press on it. So we'll, we'll uh, just play that, and uh, I'll be back on the mic in a minute. Uh, well, well, I know I do this every morning. I try to Ooh. slow down my drive just a bit to hit mm -hmm. every green light. Or speed up. Or speed, or yeah. speed up a little. Yeah. yeah. It's easier to do it at 3 in the morning when there's not as many cars on the road. But several people do it, and our traffic expert, Jason Luber, explains how a town in the metro is trying to assist drivers to feel like they don't have to do Right. That. And, you know, and I hear this frustration all the time yeah. about just your situation, right. trying to get through these lights. 
where they can just time the lights so you can keep on flowing. Yeah. Well, Castle Rock is doing just that and making your drive smoother. Now, the town made a traffic light improvement and 19 intersections on major roadways like oh. Plum Creek Parkway, Wolfensburger, Wilcox, Fifth Street. They call the improvements automatic traffic signal performance measures. In other words, a tool that allows the public works department there to monitor signal performance and make real-time signal adjustments. And the goal is to help alleviate traffic congestion during peak periods and cut that wait time at the red lights when there's minimal traffic on the side streets. Now, the project started in December. Castle Rock Public Works is continuing to implement these signal timing improvements to all the intersections in Castle Rock. Hopefully, uh, more towns adopt yeah. that. Yeah, around that's that's yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, so the yes, thank you for the applause. Uh, I'll take it on, on behalf of uh, Castle Rock. Uh, so that project was referenced in the, the plan document. That was something I wanted to point out. Uh, and uh, they made reference to, uh, you know, well, this should be expanded to the, the rest of the region. And we agree, it's also included in the plan. Um, but the one thing that wasn't included in the media coverage that I think is significant is that this is a multi-agency uh, project. Uh, Castle Rock was leading, but with the, uh, the, the CDOT Region 1 signals so closely uh, integrated into their system, uh, the, the uh, automated tra traffic signal performance measures, data, and dashboard are hosted in a cloud environment that's used by both CDOT Region 1 and Castle Rock as part of this. So that was the preface to get into the, uh, the action item here itself. Uh, the, like we pointed out, uh, came for an informational session uh, last month. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, you know, this plan focuses on the, the tools, services, and processes to execute multimodal day-to-day -day, uh, operations of the system, you know, making sure that things are safe and reliable. And it's going to be uh, guiding the immediately pending uh, call for projects uh, uh, related to the regional transportation operations and technology set aside. So the key things just wanted to remind the group of is, you know, we're, we're talking about real time data. It's necessary to understand what is going on in the system, be able to provide a safe and reliable uh, multimodal transportation system. And that's the, using the data that, that's coming in, we'll be able to develop a collaborative and integrated management processes and, the, and strategies to be able to coordinate those operations. Uh, we are recognizing that technology is a tool. It's not the solution. Uh, it's something that's going to help uh, the, the system be able to do, to do the work that we're looking to do. Uh, and we have to recognize that there are varying capabilities uh, and needs uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So we have to be able to accommodate that. Uh, to be able to do that, we, we talk about having regional management for some key initiatives, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and Dr. Cog can continue to play a role in, in the traffic signal system improvement that we've, we've been doing over the last several decades, but we'll probably be evolving into, uh, like that story was pointing out, we're, we're um, working with uh, data coming in and uh, analyzing performance measures that could then be used to tweak the system and, and optimize operations. So in the plan, uh, we have uh, several sets of initiatives broken into three groups, primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary items are, are listed here, and they are focusing on the foundational uh, initiatives uh, on which the, the rest of the, the planning document will focus. And here uh, I'll point out the um, situational awareness platform uh, is uh, you know, being, uh, being able to pull in data and understand what's going on uh, in real time. Uh, the performance measures data platform is using that archive data and being able to understand uh, where there's uh, degradation in operations and uh, what can be uh, changed to optimize operations. Building uh, on all the data that's available, uh, we have to develop strategies and processes to collaboratively uh, work together. Currently, uh, with the traffic signal systems, for example, 
we do that in a static basis where we have time of day schedules that Dr. Cog has worked to provide with uh, local agencies and have uh, the, the traffic move across uh, jurisdictional boundaries in a coordinated fashion. With the advent of all this extra data coming in, we have to come up with strategies that are more dynamic and be able to continue to uh, keep that coordination across jurisdictional boundaries. And then uh, we also have uh, improvements with the, the transit operations and uh, uh, traffic incident management. This is a, a quick graphic from the plan itself showing how we're talking about the data. The situational awareness platform is uh, taking the data that is currently available, showing real time what's going on so that the operations and emergency responders uh, can take action uh, in the field and, and at uh, traffic management centers. The performance monitoring data archive platform is a reference to using that same data to, uh, like I mentioned before, looking for degradation and, and be able to optimize operations uh, over time. And then finally, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is the multimodal regional uh, travel information platform. Uh, right now we have a number of different travel information sources uh, making it difficult for travelers to make the best decisions. So what we're talking about is being able to bring access to all that information into one place so that the, the public, the travelers, can make better mobility decisions. And then here's the, just the continuation of our, our initiatives that we were talking about. The, um, just highlighting quickly, evacuation planning and continuity of operations or direct response to the, Marshall, the recent Marshall fires. Um, and then we're looking for improvements in travel information coordination and safety projects and being able to support uh, transportation demand management. So that was my quick summary of the document that was available through the packet uh, for, for review um, and uh, have a uh, proposed uh, action statement here and available for any questions. Thank you. Greg, uh, any discussion, questions on this? <laughs> uh, Director Solstein. That one. Um, thank you very much, an excellent presentation. I always, um, you know, wonder how we can better get the word out to the public that this kind of thing is happening. Because I think, you know, when you're out there driving, you have no idea these kinds of things are in place. You know, we just drive, maybe we're looking at Google Maps or something to try to find the best route, but all of this is really cool. And I always struggle in, in my work and, and just in all the things that we're doing is, how do we let the public know this is, this is happening? Or, I mean, I think it's important that, you know, folks know that this kind of work is going on and there's a command center out there that's uh, helping to... Uh, uh, at, uh, at traffic and, and reduce emission and air pollution. So, could you comment on that? Doug, you, oh, yeah, I, I agree with you uh, 100%. Um, the, it seems that uh, the, the only press we get is negative press. When we, people know about us when we're doing something wrong, uh, which is unfortunate. But I think, you know, by that example, we're seeing you know, pointing out that there are, uh, you know, efforts that we're making and, there, and they are. Uh, having benefits, and I think that that's where we're talking about the availability of data and performance measures. We can uh, uh, promote the dashboards, you know, showing you know how well we are doing, or, or, or admittedly, it's like, hey, there's areas for improvement, and that's what we're focusing on, you know, uh, immediately. So I, I agree, it is a struggle, but I, I think bringing attention to the positive things we do is is the right step. Thank you. As a retired member of the press, I take great umbrage at that. <laughs> uh, Director Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, great question. I appreciate you bringing it up, Mike. I, I've, I've said this for a long time. This is, kind of, this is the hidden jewel of Dr. Cog, this program. No one knows a whole lot about it, and I think some of that has to do with the fact that engineers are sometimes modest and uh, like to work behind the scenes. Yeah, true, right? I kind of chuckled when I saw a flow chart up there. I'm like, you can't have an engineering presentation without a flow chart, right? <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I think you're right, and this is something I'm gonna bring to the attention of our communications department to get the word out, because we do profiles for each uh, corridor that we retime and optimize, and it, it's very useful information. This is a large um, mitigation strategy for us and, and as it relates to ozone, too. 
Um, so we're, you know, it's something that we should be proud of in the work that we're doing, and we'll, we'll do a better job of getting the word out. So thank you, Mike. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, could there, uh, Director Williams? Go ahead. Make this work. Um, so my understanding is that a lot of this network involves cameras that are recording, and, and are those recordings saved and are they shared with local police departments from a safety aspect? Um, there's accidents happening or crimes happening or whatever. That sounds like a wonderful thing to me too. Uh, you're right, there are uh, what we call traffic cameras and, and you see them out there. Uh, and uh, the recording of them varies uh, quite a bit over the region. Uh, uh, historically, is they've avoided recording them so they wouldn't be uh, called upon for discovery. Uh, things have changed. Uh, some jurisdictions here, they have the public safety uh, hosting the, uh, as part of the enterprise uh, the system of, of signals and they take on the responsibility of dealing with uh, requests for uh, looking at the data and stuff. So in those cases, it would be recorded. Uh, but, but yeah, so there's a, the answer is it's a mix. It's, it's not a universal approach. There we go. Uh, Commissioner Stan. Just wanted to follow up on what Doug Rex said about pollution. Um, in the CDOT uh, greenhouse gas rule, one of the remediation things is traffic signal synchronization and also roundabouts, anything to keep traffic moving and uh, not idling. So that's a key thing to promote from a public affairs standpoint. The other point that you mentioned was the wildfires, Superior. I mean, there's an emergency piece of this which really should be put out there, not just for wildfire, but for mass evacuation or things like that. This is extremely important stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Greg, I, I just had a quick question, and I noticed coming in yesterday, um, I managed to get every red light when I was going. Well, yeah. You should be congratulated. Well, I, <laughs> but but it, it was on Wadsworth. It was on Wadsworth from Bellevue up to uh, Hamden and then north to 6th Avenue. And it occurred to me that because I was coming in for city council, it was mid-afternoon, and that uh, there might have been a different plan in place for the PM when it might be outbound instead of inbound. Is that what I ran into? It's possible. You know, not or just knowing, bad signal timing. <laughs> yeah, not knowing the details. We, we hope that it isn't a bad signal timing. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, we provide uh, good plans for the, mm -hmm. the agencies to, keep, to maintain. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they degrade over time, and I, I say they degrade over time in the sense that the traffic patterns change, right. and so you have to change the system to uh, to meet that. And that's exactly. where the automated traffic signal system performance measures are supposed to help, because right. you're going to be detecting that more um, on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Currently, the traditional approach for signal timing uh, is they say, we, we heard you. Uh, you had a problem with this corridor. We'll go take a look. And then they, they collect data and determine, yeah, we need to do a new timing plan. So that's, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Well, I can imagine, though, that part of the problem is Wadsworth being a two-way corridor, that it's very difficult to run a, a progression where the platoons can continue in the peak direction in the morning without inconveniencing or stopping those who are going against that progression southbound or outbound is that it's much easier on a one-way corridor like Broadway Lincoln. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, okay. But, but the effort is to address the balance. When you right. see that there's a demand going both directions, you're not going to favor only the one direction. You'll look to address okay. the balance as best you can. Okay. Generally speaking, it's a very, you know, when I come in in the morning, like this morning, it was, it's very good. I, I was able to move. And when I come home in the evening after council uh, and use Wadsworth, it's, um, I'm in the progression, so it's... And, and another thing, and we're just getting into details here, but it, it could have been that there was an emergency vehicle had gone through recently. That, that throws it off. And then, yeah, then the, the system right. has to recover, and that takes some time. Thank you. I gave a presentation once to ITE, and for the honorarium, I asked that they give me an Opticon, 
and they refused. <laughs> <laughs> That would, and that you were would, immediately arrested? That, that, would, yeah. <laughs> that would have solved all my problems. Thank you. Do we have a motion on this item? Director Williams. Yes, so moved. Thank you. What it says up there. Second. Thank you. Uh, CEO Johnson. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Are there any abstentions? Very good, thank you. Uh, let's move on to uh, federal performance measures targets. This is this is going to be interesting. Alvin, you are up. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. And as has already been mentioned, Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, unfortunately, if you've had a chance to look at my presentation, it is around 30 slides. Uh, so before we get started, I do want to check with the chair how you would like to handle questions. Um, there are some breaks in between particular areas or at the end. Uh, we'll, we'll take questions at each break. How's that? Thank you, Chair. Thank uh, you. As I get started, I do want to thank our staff from CDOT who are here present. They've been invaluable in this effort to set our performance targets. And so with that, um, we are discussing three performance areas today, safety, infrastructure condition, and system performance. Um, these fall under the purview of the Federal Highway Administration. Um, on this, I do want to note that I provided some information slides for each of these performance areas. Um, as you look at those, as you question why this data, why this timing, um, why this threshold, a lot of this is just a requirement from our federal partners from the guidance that they've uh, given down to the MPOs. So each of these has their own data, their own timing, um, what targets we're actually setting, what those thresholds we're looking at are. So the first I'll kick us off with is our safety targets. Um, I do apologize, I might get clinical in this language. I'll be using targets. Um, I do want to recognize that each of these numbers are a fatality on our roadways. Um, and so while I might be speaking clinically, uh, we do recognize that here at Dr. Cog. Uh, for safety, there are five performance measures, number and rate of fatalities, number and rate of serious injuries, and number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. The calculation is a five-year rolling average using five years worth of data. And for all of these, you're going to see similar federal guidance. Targets should be realistic and achievable, not aspirational. And then Dr. Cog can support the state or set our own targets for the region. Uh, for this particular performance area, there is no financial penalty or funding restriction for Dr. Cog if we do not meet our targets. But we will face additional scrutiny in our planning process during our next four-year certification from our federal partners. This is going to be the sixth time we set these targets related to safety. Um, on your screen now is just a quick snapshot of how we've done the previous five years. Uh, unfortunately, just due to data lag, we are unable to show you how we are currently in 2021 or 2022. Um, but we do have an estimate from 2021 that there is approximately 315 fatalities in the Dr. Cog MPO area in 2021. We were doing a number of actions at Dr. Cog to improve safety that uh, we've had historically um, and that we're continuing on even without our safety targets that we have to set. Um, we're looking at updating our taking action on Regional Vision Zero plan this year. Um, we just up, uh, amended our transportation improvement program and we now have $1.7 billion going to safety projects that will improve safety in the region. Um, our dedicated safety and Regional Vision Zero planner has been a participant on safety studies in the region. Um, we were awarded a 405C grant to explore a regional crash data consortium that some of y'all might be a part of. So there's a lot of actions going on at Dr. Cog to improve safety across multiple arenas. Getting into the target setting, we'll start with fatalities. Uh, we did have previous guidance from the board to achieve zero fatalities by 2040. So that's what this graph is showing is a projection from our last available data point when that first uh, target for zero was set back in 2020. So uh, as I mentioned, it's five years worth of data. 2019 and 2020 are actual observed fatalities in the region. 2021 through 2023 are our projection using an average reduction to get to zero by 2040. And so the calculation is adding up 270, 272, 259, 246, and 233, and dividing by five. Similar setup for our number of serious injuries. Again, looking at two years worth of observed data for serious injuries on our roadways in the MPO area, and then using the previous projection, so a yearly average reduction of 68 serious injuries every year to get to zero by 2045. 
and then our non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries is a combination of that, zero non-motorized fatalities by 2040 and zero non-motorized serious injuries by 2045. Again, two years worth of observed data, 2019 and 2020, and then projecting that out using our average yearly reduction required to get us to zero by each of those horizon years. For the rate targets, uh, which I did not show on a, on a slide or in a graph, um, those just take into account vehicle miles traveled in the region, specifically 100, 100 million vehicle miles traveled in the region. So those are uh, just those decimal targets you're seeing on your slide right now. I'll pause before I move on to a second performance area. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Stan. Uh, thank you for the data, appreciate the trend. A uh, question on non-motorized vehicles. Are you including scooters, hoverboards, et cetera, in that? And are you collecting good data? Because it seems to me, especially in the city of Denver, especially around bars where people are trying to avoid DUIs in cars, they're, they're driving drunk on these vehicles. Plus, uh, we've seen a huge increase in pedestrians, et cetera, being hit. And do you have good data? Yep, um, so two parts to that question. Uh, Non-motorized, according to the federal definition, is um, uh, e-bikes, scooters, uh, people rollerblading. Um, it can be someone on a motorized toy car. It could be a construction worker on the road that's hit by a vehicle. So the term motor non-motorized is very all-encompassing. So that is captured in the data. Um, to the second piece, um, that uh, it is up to the, the officer who's responding to c confirm all those pieces, but uh, we do work with CDOT uh, and their data team to uh, check the data and confirm it for our MPO area. Thanks. Other questions? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Director Guzman. Hello? <laughs> these microphones. Uh, these data points uh, and uh, fatalities are often disproportionately affecting people in low-income low neighborhoods, people of color and the elderly. That could be lack of sidewalks or other issues. Are we tracking any of that data and how are we using that to create an equity um, vision for how we create justice in those communities doing this work? Yep, um, so uh, part of what we've used the data historically for is looking at our taking action on regional vision zero plan. So we do create a high injury network and a critical corridor network in the region. Um, as a part of an update to our taking action on regional vision zero plan this uh, year, we are exploring how to more explicitly include equity in that, whether it's uh, a new objective or it's built in throughout the plan, but that is something we're looking at to improve this year. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner. So I guess uh, my question is uh, perhaps following up on the, the previous um, topic of how do we communicate this to communities as well? Because it's gonna take, this is a all hands on deck approach. And um, as Commissioner Stanton mentioned, we're seeing a lot of fatalities. Um, and so how do we get everybody else to say, this is, there are so many variables to this that roads design is really only one component of it. There's also human behavior that there, unfortunately there's really no control over that. So it, what is the plan to try to get people on board to say like, let's, we're all in this together, let's figure it out. Yeah, I would first start off with, um, our board has been very clear about wanting to achieve zero fatalities in the region. Um, the, uh, we actually went before them a couple of years back to see what that horizon year really could be for the region. Um, there are a couple of things that we're currently doing and that CDOT itself, themselves are also doing. Uh, we do have our regional vision zero work group. So they meet monthly and we bring together different planning staff, engineering staff from across the region, um, diverse staff. So bringing in different communities perspectives on uh, crashes, fatalities in the region. Um, CDOT has just kicked off a new uh, safety program. Dr. Cog is a participant on that. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, we're just starting an update to our new plan and we're uh, involved in a couple of peer exchanges with other MPOs who might be farther along in their safety process than we are. So we're looking to learn from them and how they've moved forward safety in their region. Thank you. Other questions? All right, go ahead, Alvin. Uh, the second performance area is infrastructure condition. Um, I'll start with pavement. There are four performance measures under pavement condition, the percent of interstate pavements in good and poor condition, the percent of non-interstate national highway system pavements in good and poor condition. Um, these look at four condition rating areas, 
roughness, cracking, rutting, or faulting. Um, as with all of these, these are intended to be realistic, achievable. We can set our own for the region or support the states. Uh, for this performance area and the subsequent ones, we are uh, recommending that we support the state's targets. Uh, and again, as an MPO, we face no financial penalty or funding restriction, uh, but just additional scrutiny at our next four-year uh, certification process. And as an MPO, we are only required to set four-year targets, while CDOT has set two-year and four-year targets. Another quick snapshot of how the state did in achieving their previous targets over the performance period. Um, this last performance period, Dr. Cog did support the state's pavement condition targets. And so uh, just seeing on the screen, for each of these, there is a desired trend. So do we want to be higher than or lower than our target or our baseline value? And then same with bridge condition. Um, so again, higher in the good condition, lower in the poor condition. Um, I mentioned this just to show once we get into the maps you're going to see, some of the bar charts you're going to see, you might be wondering, uh, well, where is all the rest of the data? Um, a lot of the facilities in our region are actually categorized as fair condition. Um, that could be up to 50 to 60 percent depending on the facility type that you're looking at. So when we're looking at the performance measures, those are only for good condition and poor condition. We do have a significant number of fit facilities in the region that are in fair condition. And so just a visual representation of that for pavement condition in the region. I will note that uh, for the performance measure for pavement condition, it is only the interstate system and the non-interstate national highway system. Um, you are seeing some more roads on this network than are part of that calculation. But even with that, you're seeing a, a significant amount of our roadways are in fair condition, so that purple color. And like I mentioned, um, the bar charts are showing Dr. Cog's current condition, so 2017 through 2021 data. That's going to be consistent across all of the future graphs I show you. So if you're wondering about a particular facility that opened in 2022, if there's projects coming online or coming online in the next few years, those aren't showing here. So there could be some improvement in some of these various metrics that you're seeing. The horizontal lines are the four-year targets that CDOT has established that we are recommending that we support. So for... Uh, the proposed four-year target of greater than 47%, we would like to be above that as a state, and then below 3.5% in poor condition for the state. And then the same setup for the national highway system, non-interstate system. So again, Dr. Cog data overlaid with CDOT's four-year targets for good and poor condition. And uh, as you can see on this one, there's a significant percentage of data that would just fall in the fair category. So. Uh, Facilities in the region are in fair good condition overall. Bridge condition is the data that gets reported at the National Bridge Inventory. There are two performance measures. Uh, percent of bridges by deck area classified in good condition and poor condition. There are four rating areas looking at deck superstructure, substructure, and culvert. Um, for each of those, if any of those fall into the poor category, the bridge is considered poor. Uh, and as I previously said, realistic achievable targets um, no financial penalty, and we can support the states or set our own, and we're recommending we support the states. And then a map of bridges on the national highway system. Again, you're seeing a significant number of bridges in the purple fare category, so good and fair make up a significant piece of our national highway system bridges in the region. Um, for Bridge deck area, at least for Dr. Cog, 2021, you're seeing about 41% of bridges are in good condition. Um, the rest of that would be in fair, and only about 3.5% are actually in poor condition in the region. Again, it's the same setup. The horizontal line are the four-year targets that we're recommending we support that the state has already set. CDOT actually uh, develops forecasts for pavement and bridge condition. They use their, uh, they use their system to incorporate uh, what would happen if, with the life cycle investment strategies that are being recommended. So they use anticipated budgets, high end, low end, to understand what that return on investment is. And so the targets that you're seeing are based on that budget. Um, part of all of these performance measure areas is using the best available data and being realistic in those. So um, in case if you do see maybe some decreases in particular areas, increases in particular areas, that's just uh, what is expected. And so those targets need to be realistic as we're setting those. And those have already been finalized. And so it's just up to us as the MPO to either support the state's targets or set our own. For a piece of transparency also included in your packet in the memo and the presentation are the four-year targets that Dr. Cog is recommending we support that the state has already set. 
for each of those, there is that desired trend of being either above the baseline or above the target or below the baseline and below the target when it comes time to actually check how we did in four years. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, it occurs to me that there are, is a lot of roadway that is in between good and poor. Is there any sort of a predictive um, uh, analysis that can be done to tell us which areas that are not good, but they are not poor, but how quickly will that segment versus another segment fall into the poor category? I imagine that there is from CDOT, um, you know, some, uh, a stretch that's more highly traveled, perhaps more truck traffic. Um, how, do, how, do we, uh, how do we work with those in between? Yeah, uh, I'm sure that is part of the forecast. I'd actually invite our staff from CDOT up to talk on that um, if they have information on how that's taken into account. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's the short answer. Okay. I think the, the greater answer is if you look at the way the targets are established, they're, they're established for poor as well as good. Right. By default, that gives you that area of fair. When we go through and we model these things, we are, you know, generally the normal run of the mill course of CDOT business, we're naturally looking at the next four years because that establishes our four-year projects. But our asset management plan requires a 10-year financial plan. And within that, um, there's a lot of things that go into it. One is federal work types, and it sort of dictates whether or not we're going to reconstruct something versus apply a preventive measure. That preventive measure, a preventive maintenance activity is typically the things that go towards fair roads to try to you know, keep them either in fair status or get them up to good, but also making sure that we're keeping our good, for good roads good. So we, we are modeling it and we are programming projects to achieve that desired condition level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, CEO Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Deborah Johnson, RTD. Question, I believe there's a nexus to this. When we talk about um, the aspirational goal of Vision Zero, I'd be remiss not to state, while we talk about the infrastructure conditions, one of the contributing factors to safe paths to travel is the lack of infrastructure. So when we look at this holistically and we talk about people trying to traverse a highway or things of the like, I speak from the vantage point of we have people out in the streets trying to get to a bus stop or we have a bus stop you know, that is position or any other type of transit amenity that is positioned in a precarious position because we don't have auspices over providing that infrastructure. So holistically, thinking of the MPO working with a multitude of different jurisdictions within the region, what can be done collectively as we look to identify corridors, uh, factoring in what Director Guzman said, especially when we look at uh, communities of color, um, seniors and people with disabilities, that are often impacted by the lack of in infrastructure? I know it was a loaded question. I don't expect you to create magic here, but I just felt that I needed to bring that out in this forum because as we talk about this, we're not going to achieve Vision Zero if we don't have adequate infrastructure and safe paths to travel for individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, first off, I would um, note these are just our federal performance measures that we're setting. Um, so just the floor, uh, we have so many more metrics that we're following within Metro Vision, and we have so many other products that are being done. So like related to how other folk are traveling, people of color, low income, folk without a car, um, we do have other plans, products that we're building into our core plan. So our regional complete streets toolkit um, is one key piece to that that's new, that's been Im embedded in the transportation improvement program, that application process. Um, it was built into our regional transportation plan, this last major update as well. So. Um, I would say throughout the agency, we're looking at various ways and using various products to highlight that different ways people are moving and moving people, not just moving cars. Thank you. Other questions? Director Shaw. Thank you. Um, this is more of a technical question also, but um, I noticed all these conditions, faulting and cracking and rough roads and so on and so forth. Um, this time of year, I think we see a lot of potholes and patching with um, cold patch mixtures that often don't last very long. Do we 
is there a designation for areas that have been patched that are more likely to fail, even if the rest of the road around it is in relatively good condition? I do not know that response. I would see if CDOT has. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, by, by the way, I'm, I'm William Johnson, CDOT Performance and Asset Management Branch. Uh, just to be clear, a poor road is not a failed road. It just means that it, it's reached a certain condition threshold that we rate it as poor. It doesn't mean that it's unsafe or it's not turning to gravel and it's not filled with potholes. I think that what, one thing you have to understand is this is for interstates and NHS. It makes up a very small part of the total Dr. Cog system. It makes up about 50% of Colorado, so CDOT, C highways. And within that, we actually do our data collection for all interstate and NHS. So we're, we're covering your locally owned NHS roads, and we do it about this time of year. So we're, we're, I guess, you know, by proxy, we're capturing the worst of the worst that the road could be in. And, you know, with that, we have our regular maintenance activities that is ensuring that we're, we're filling those potholes that could be of danger. Um, and also, you know, it, it's for getting things prepared for our construction season. And that's really where we run out with the big engineering construction projects where everybody's complaining we close the roads and have traffic safety zones. Um, we do track those roads. So as we're, we do maintenance activities on it, we're accounting for it within our asset management system. We understand how much money we're investing towards it. We're altering the condition, we're collecting that condition and updating our system, and we're identifying those roads that we forecasted to become poor. Uh, the other thing is, is that there's an 80% model match requirement. So we're really trying to match 80% of the recommendations for the system. But the most important thing is, hey, where does that 20% go? Uh, that 20% goes to roads that, uh, sorry, lack of a better term, blow up on us. In, you know, in the middle of a construction season, those things where it's just like, oh, man, this didn't show up in our model and we're, we're going to address it. I hope, hope that provided some information. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Alvin. Let's move on to uh, reliability. Great. So this will be my last section. Um, this is actually part of a larger performance area. If you were with us earlier. Yeah. You were with us last year, um, we covered half of this related to our emissions reduction and traffic congestion targets. Today we're discussing travel time reliability and freight reliability, so the last half of that performance area. Um, again, C CDOT sets two-year and four-year targets. Dr. Cog is only required to set four. Um, there are two performance measures related to travel time reliability, a percent of the person miles traveled on the interstate and the non-interstate national highway system that are reliable. Uh, the calculation is the 80th percentile travel time compared to the 50th percentile travel time, um, and that creates um, a level of travel time reliability that uh, per guidance, if it's less than 1.5, it's considered reliable. So anything higher than 1.5, we consider unreliable. Um, we are recommending that we support the state's targets uh, and again, a realistic and achievable for these two-year and four-year targets. Um, a quick snapshot of how we did previous cycle uh, for both the travel time reliability and freight reliability, we did achieve our four-year targets. The state did achieve their four-year targets, so they were either better than the target or better than the baseline that was established. So the bar charts are, again, the Dr. Cog data from 2017 to 2021. Horizontal lines are those four-year targets that we're recommending we support. Uh, for both of these, uh, we would like to be higher than the horizontal line graph that's shown on the chart. Um, for travel time reliability, that looks at uh, four different times with between 6 a.m. and um, 8 p.m. And like I mentioned, it's that 85th percentile compared to 50th percentile travel time. So that threshold is established through federal guidance. And then because freight uh, is a different beast in terms of travel, there is a freight reliability metric that's separate. Dr. Hogg, again, is only setting a four-year target. In this case, it's truck travel time reliability. Uh, and in this case, it's 95th percentile compared to 50th percentile. And in this case, it's going to be an index value. So uh, bringing back that 1.5, uh, 
Anything below 1.5 is considered reliable. Anything above is not. And that threshold is also one of our guide guidance coming down from our federal partners. So the proposed four-year target from CDOT is 1.46, and we're recommending we support that. I would note uh, a correction on this slide that that uh, greater than 1.46 is incorrect. It should be less than 1.46. Um, since we are recommending that we support the state's target, CDOT uses predictive modeling. Uh, you might recommend, remind, remember this slide from a previous time we were talking about system performance when we brought traffic congestion before you. Um, in this case, uh, we're again looking at the lingering effects of COVID-19, which is recognizing how travel might return uh, over the next couple of years and building that into the predictive modeling that they've established. So again, for transparency already included in your memo and in the packet and what will be included in a resolution to the board uh, pending uh, supportive action are the proposed four-year targets that Dr. Cog is recommending to establish where we support the state's four-year targets for travel time and freight reliability. And we're here before you now. We hope to go before the board tomorrow. We are facing some larger deadlines. So February 27th to establish our safety targets and then March 30th to establish our infrastructure condition and our reliability targets. Uh, for our four-year targets, so PM2 and PM3, we do have the opportunity at the two-year mark to reevaluate. Um, that'll be up to CDOT if they're seeing anything different on the ground and they want to reevaluate those four-year targets. Uh, if that is the case and Dr. Cog does support those targets, we will also be required to take an action at that two-year mark. And then one last piece uh, that came up at the Transportation Advisory Committee is just, well, how are other MPOs doing? How do we compare? Um, I would just uh, note on this slide and um, our, on the uh, electronic slide deck are links to our measuring success webpage on the webpage. On our website, we do link to Federal Highways Dashboard, Federal Transit Dashboard, and CDOT's dashboard for each of these different performance measures. So you can see how other states are doing, how other MPOs are doing, how Colorado Springs is doing compared to Denver, um, if you were so interested. And with that, the requested motion to frame any further discussion is to move to recommend that the Board of Directors establish the 2023 safety targets and four-year pavement condition, bridge condition, travel time reliability, and freight reliability targets for the Dr. Cog MPO area as part of federal performance-based planning and programming requirements. Great, thank you. Before we get to a motion, uh, any questions on this last section? Okay, do we have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Got a second? Thank you, sir. Any discussion? Okay. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you. We will move ahead. Uh, moving into informational briefings, uh, fiscal year 2024-25 Unified Planning Work Program update. Mr. Todd Cottrell. Todd. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And so I just learned 10 minutes before this meeting that uh, we're changing up the presentation. So hopefully it goes smooth. So I'm sure it'll be awesome. I'm sure it will. Thank you so much. So you're probably asking, so why are we here? Why are the two tip guys up here? So part of our responsibility also involves the other short-range planning program um, for Dr. Cog, the Unified Planning Work Program. But what is this? Essentially, this is the MPO's work program over a two-year period. So this is a federally required document. Uh, our current document is for F federal fiscal years 22 and 23. You're getting almost to the halfway point of FY23. So it's, uh, we, the last couple of months, we've been in the process to update this document to FY24 and 25. FY24 will begin October 1st later this year. So we just wanted to take you through a little bit of background in terms of the MPO and so what are the required elements for the MPO and how the UPWP fits into that. Um, Josh will take you through a little bit of an overview of the existing document a mentee exercise, and then finally wrap up with, well, what are our next steps? So as an MPO, what is the purpose? Um, and we can look to the federal regs for this. And basically it's to have a performance-based multimodal transportation planning process that involves what we call the three Cs, continuing, cooperative, and comprehensive we must involve that within our planning process. 
Um, that also extends to the development of what we would consider the two major elements, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, um, here the RTP or Regional Transportation Plan, and the TIP or the Transportation Improvement Program. Part of the MPO process is also to include a, a documented participation plan to gather the feedback from the public um, in developing this entire process. So there's also what we would consider 10 planning factors, um, and these are embedded within the federal legislation. And so MPOs must consider these when, when they implement um, our projects, our programs, our strategies, and all the services as an MPO that we provide. Um, most of these have continued um, as they are over time, at least the last 20 years. Steve, you can probably correct me, we're probably like 40 years these planning factors have been here, 40 years, right? So they have been around for a long time. Um, in addition to that, uh, we must also provide a performance-based approach to support the national goals some of which you just heard from Elvin, um, and then also be consistent with the development of regional ITS architectures. Again, we just heard about that item earlier uh, this morning from Greg. And then also a coordinated public, uh, public transit human service uh, transportation plan that is also part of the responsibilities that fall within the MPO. There's also what we call federal emphasis areas, um, and these change from uh, administration to administration. Sometimes there are no emphasis areas. Sometimes there might be just one or two. Um, right now we do have eight of them, I believe, including uh, GHD goals, um, diversity, complete streets, public involvement, um, using planning and environmental linkages studies, um, incorporating data. So they vary from, from administration to administration but these generally help guide the work that we would conduct. And going back to um, the planning areas and these emphasis areas, there are no instructions from the federal government or USDOT, from federal highway, from federal transit, on how we must apply these to the MPO in our work program. Some would call that good, some would call that bad, there are no instructions. So it's up to us as an MPO and as a region to figure out how to implement and to involve these within our work. There's other things that as an MPO we must also consider. Um, congestion management process, um, looking at um, providing a safe and efficient integrated management operations for the multimodal system. Again, uh, this is something that Robert and his team you'll hear about um, usually in the fall time frame. A metropolitan transportation plan, as I said earlier, um, this is referred to as the RTP or regional transportation plan within the Denver metro area. And of course the TIP, Transportation Improvement Program, and what we sometimes refer to as the ALOP report or the annual listing of obligated projects. Uh, and finally getting to part of those requirements, um, the Unified Planning Work Program, as I mentioned earlier, this is a two-year document that essentially is the work program. It outlines all of the information um, that the MPL will be working on over a two-year period, including who will perform that work, whether it's Dr. Cog or one of our, our planning partners, um, what is the schedule to complete that work. If there's any products, it outlines what those would be. Um, proposed funding by the individual activities and tasks, which Josh will get into here in a little bit, and of course, a summary of the total funding that is available. So as we sort of just went through all of those requirements as an MPO, there's also a lot of things as an MPO that Dr. Cog does that won't show up in any legislation, but it really supports all of those requirements that we must do. Um, it'd be hard pressed to remove one of these items because they're not required, just because it is so important to uh, accomplishing the work of those required elements. So our regional data, all the modeling that we would do, um, providing technical assistance, uh, scenario planning for um, that it goes into the RTP development, the work that we do to um, support the local plans, uh, the traffic operations program, which you heard from Greg earlier, 
uh, TDM planning, and of course the traffic count uh, program. There's several things uh, included on this slide that we have included within this current document. Um, as we were thinking about the development of this new plan two years ago, and we will continue to go through that process for the next two year cycle. So corridor planning, uh, community based transportation plans, of course, uh, greenhouse gas was a, a big initiative that was part of this, uh, part of this document. Um, we are also instructed to look at housing. Um, so those discussions have, have begun. And we've also looked at and, and started the process to work with TIP sponsors um, on a monthly basis to gather that status of those individual projects. Um, Vision Zero, um, and of course, looking at all of the individual uh, new programs that were developed through the IIJA, including congestion relief, healthy streets, reconnecting communities, um, and so on. So this is the slide that Ron likes to refer to us internally as these are the things that keeps him, him up at night. Um, these are the issues that are continuing to be out there. They're emerging. Um, they're issues that we know exist or we know that they exist, but we don't know how yet to exactly address them. So the, the population is growing. It's also aging. Uh, we also really need to look at, it, at equity and how to include that within our planning process. Um, again, looking at that transportation and land use balance, those technology components, uh, mobility as a service. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, but will continue to be something to look at greenhouse gas emissions, uh, micro mobility. Um, with COVID, obviously, there was a lot of changes in telework. Um, and how does that sort of play into our future plans? And of course, funding Im uh, limitations will always be part of the issues that we have. There's never going to be enough funding to go around. So is there anything that we can do about that? So at this point, I'll turn it over to Josh, and he can go through a little bit more in detail on how this current document is structured, um, and then he'll take you through a, a little bit of an exercise to gather your individual thoughts on what we may want to include over the next two years. All right. Thanks, Todd. So in the current document, uh, we do have seven objectives. Um, I'll walk through each of them for you, uh, but just want to give you kind of a picture of the current structure of the document uh, to get kind of your thoughts uh, moving in terms of what might be in the future document. So uh, objective one is program administration and coordination. This is really about staff development. It's about the unified planning work program. Uh, so what we intend to do kind of internally and with our partners around the region and that kind of administrative side of things. Objective two is on planning coordination and outreach. There's really two parts of this. This is our coordination with agencies around the region, uh, as well as with the general public. So our public engagement plan is part of this objective, as well as all of that general coordination uh, with all of you. Objective three uh, is the Probably the largest in the document, this is long range and multimodal planning. This is where uh, you'll find the regional transportation plan. This is where Metrovision is located, as well as a lot of those mode specific plans. So active transportation, freight, uh, as well as our complete streets um, and our new corridor and community based uh, transportation planning programs. Objective four, project programming. This is really the TIP, uh, the Transportation Improvement Program. This is where uh, all of the information around holding calls for projects, uh, programming those projects in the TIP, as well as the TIP set-asides is located. Objective five is transportation systems operations. Uh, this is uh, basically that presentation that you just saw from Greg. Uh, the RTO strategic plan will be in this as well as our congestion management process, um, all of our information technology, um, as well as safety and security planning and our innovative mobility planning. Objective six is public transportation planning. Um, this one is a little bit unique in that most of uh, the tasks within this objective are actually accomplished through our partnership with RTD. Um, but there are some Dr. Cog-led tasks as well, specifically around our uh, FTA 5310 and coordinated transit plan. 
And then objective seven is on planning data and modeling. This is a lot of that support work that goes into our other products. Um, so a lot of our modeling, all of the data that's available to the public through our regional data catalog, traffic counts, et cetera, are all within this. So we do want to have an exercise to get feedback from all of you. Uh, for those of you that are Dr. Cog board members, uh, you'll have gone through a similar exercise, but we want to make sure that we're reaching out to each of our committees uh, to get feedback from all of the perspectives around the region. So this is a Menti poll. Um, so uh, you can either use your smartphone to use the QR code on your screen, or you can uh, type into a browser menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com and enter the code 61819955. Then once you're there, if you can either hit the, the thumbs up or the heart, either one, just to let us know that some folks are able to access it. And once I switch the slide, uh, you will still see the menti.com and the code at the top of your screen. So if you aren't there yet, you'll still have a chance to jump on. Um, and for those that we're at board work session and already went through this exercise. Feel free to participate again. If you have any new thoughts or just bear with us, we'll be through shortly. So as Todd mentioned, we do have 10 federal planning factors to take into account. Uh, we just wanted to get your thoughts on kind of a ranking of these. Um, we'll of course take all 10 into account within our work. We are required to under federal law, uh, but some of these might be worth spending a little bit more time on, might be more of a focus for our region. So if uh, you have the chance, go ahead and rank these. Let us know where we should maybe be spending the majority of our time. Starting to see some responses come in. And just so you all know how this input will be taken into account, staff is currently working together to uh, draft some ideas on what might be in the next document. So uh, we've had this uh, presentation for Transportation Advisory Committee uh, as well as board work session. Um, collecting all of that data and providing it back to staff so that they can take into account all of your priorities for the region as they're thinking through uh, what they want to include in the next iteration of this document. So it looks like at the moment we have safety at the top followed by efficient operations and accessibility. You see 11 responses. Give it maybe a little bit more for anyone that's still working to wrap up, and then I will move us along. All right, last call. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it never fails. As soon as I say I'm about to change the slide, someone <laughs> else will come in. <laughs> All right. I will actually change this time like we're steady at 12. So um, the next is the same thing, but again, we had those eight planning emphasis areas that are a little bit different from the planning factors. These come from the administration. Um, just uh, to provide a little bit more context on two that maybe aren't uh, as intuitive, strategic highway network is really around defense and access to military facilities, uh, federal land management agencies, that's really about access into and within uh, federally owned land, so National Park Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management. And again, we will take all of these into account um, as we are required to do, but just want to know where maybe we should spend more of our time on some than others.
like we've got 10 responses so far. Looks like climate and PEL studies are, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, climate's still at the top. Um, so I'll give a few more seconds. I know we had 12 on our last one. Um, so if anyone else is still getting their answers in, give you a little bit of time. And then we just have one more slide after this. Looks like climate, complete streets, equity are kind of the top three. PELs just below those. All right, going to go ahead and move us on. So this is just kind of an open question. Uh, just interested in what challenges, uh, in your opinion, are facing the region right now that Dr. Cog and our partners might be well suited to address through our planning work. Um, so any general topics, those might be things we're currently working on, those might be new topics um, or issues or challenges that your agency is facing that you want to coordinate with us. Um, any ideas are welcome and we'll provide those back to staff as they're thinking through what type of tasks they can be involved in moving forward. <laughs> okay, so return to office and transit's impacts, competing priorities for funding always, transportation and housing, accessibility and equity, maintaining our infrastructure, these are great topics, um, like in pen. And a lot of this um, is lining up with what we heard as well through board work session, through TAC. Um, a lot of the same issues are coming kind of to the top. So I think that's helpful for staff to see that that's from our various committees and their various perspectives, things that we want to address. I know the screen does slightly cut off the bottom. All of this will be recorded and will be available to us on the back end. So I do see 12 responses here. I know you're able to submit multiple if you want, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. So put out the notice. Any final comments, get those in. It looks like we're holding steady at 12, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, so just in terms of kind of next steps, um, so this is actually apologies. Um, this was not updated, so we still have our update to TAC on the top one. Um, in April, uh, we'll be coming back, um, or actually... Sorry, everyone. Um, so we will have an update uh, to TAC in March. Um, don't recall if we're bringing that to RTC or if we're waiting a little bit further into the process. But um, June 14th, we will be opening our public comment period on the draft program. Uh, that will be a 30-day public comment period. Um, at the end of that, we'll close that, make any revisions based on the comments that we received, and then bring that back um, through TAC in July, and then RTC and the board in August uh, for anticipated action. So um, that's kind of our upcoming schedule on the development of this document. You will see a final draft by August. Um, so with that, happy to take any questions you all might have on UPWP or our development process. Otherwise, uh, thank you all for your time. Any questions, comments? Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Moving mm -hmm. forward uh, to a fascinating topic to me, population cohort and household type forecast, a brief summary of the next, oh, 30 years. <laughs> okay. Zach Feldman presenting. Zach, thank you for being here.
Uh, good morning. I'm Zach Feldman. I'm econ an economist here with Dr. Cog and the uh, manager of the data science and analytics team. Barely speak into that. Okay. I, I think it's that I'm shorter than everybody else. So we just <laughs> hey, listen, I this feel your pain. Bit. we got to reset our expectations on height here. Um, so a lot of this is just to set expectations in terms of where things are going to the region. Um, it could also help um, a bit with perspective of both the land use modeling we do here at Dr. Cog um, and the travel modeling since the land use is an input. So it, this will kind of cover um, what a lot of our data sources are. So just a quick outline, we're gonna cover data sources. Here at Dr. Cog, we don't produce most of this data, though we use it all the time, so I want to be clear where it's coming from. Uh, and we're going to really talk about um, two areas of growth, so population growth and household growth. They're very much tied together, but we're going to see there's some variation um, that's really key in terms of variation by age and then household type. And then we'll briefly discuss the implications for the Denver region. The implications are huge, so we're not going to get into too much detail, but um, a little bit of place setting there. So primarily our data sources um, come from the census and the Colorado State Demography Office. Um, they're just an amazing partner. Um, we meet and work with them quite regularly. Um, so we're really glad to have this data available. Other MPOs around the country don't necessarily have this level of um, data availability from the state, and they have to do macro modeling in-house, which um, can cause a lot of issues and, and eat up a lot of resources. Um, the Demography Office provides us a population forecast through 2050, and it's stratified by sex and single year of age. They also provide a household forecast by county through 2050, and this is stratified by age of the household head and by household type. So critically for us, we can break this out into um, households with and without children, since that has um, some implications for transportation and housing. Uh, these links are also here for um, just informational use. We have some data briefs up on the data catalog. And the demography office also has some um, similar um, data source, some kind of summary sources. This chart is super simple, but we want to get it out there early. It's not going to be a crater in a population. The sky's not falling. I think there's been a bit of a back and forth in the messaging that there's an assumption that we're going to continue to grow as quickly as we have in the past. That's not going to be the case. There's going to be a pretty drastic slowdown. But we're not going to be like portions of the country that are seeing population declines or stagnation. So we're going to continue to see population growth. The other piece is that this, not, this is not a Denver story, this decline. If we look across um, by decade, we're seeing that we're going to see a, a national decrease in population growth, a Colorado decrease in population growth, and a Denver region decrease in population growth. So in general, the Dr. Cog region is going to move in lockstep with the state um, eventually being a little bit slower. Um, and we're going to continue to have higher growth um, than the nation as a whole. So these are going to be highlighted here, the big pieces to focus on that um, 1990 to 2020, we saw a 76% um, increase in growth in the Denver region. 2020 to 2050, we're going to see a 25% increase. So as we said before, it's not going to be a decline, but it is going to be a pretty drastic decrease in uh, population growth. Here's where we start to break things out by age, and we can see that Older adults, 65 plus, are going to continue to see uh, pretty high growth, so doubling from 2020 to 2050, and basically flat um, in the numbers for children. So under 18 is basically going to see no um, growth over the next 
30 years. Um, and this is very consistent with messaging from the de demography office, from the census, from school districts around the region. The um, housing crisis in 2008 really led to a decreasing in um, fertility and household size. So we're seeing that kind of showing up now um, in public schools and universities. Here's another way to illustrate that um, change. So as we, we see that the blue area is going to be relatively flat over the next 30 years. That's the um, under 18. And we see some slowing growth for 18 to 64. So this is our kind of what we consider the working age population. Um, and then inherently that working age population kind of the ratio to older adults is, is going to become uh, more and more dire with more older adults not working and um, fewer people working. That said, we really don't know what the next couple decades are going to look like. Older adults are probably going to be working uh, more and longer. Um, so we, the implications of that are still unclear. I wouldn't look at you. I was thinking, damn. <laughs> um, household growth, similar. It, it's not going to be a decline. It's not going to be an immediate flattening, but, but it is going to be a slowdown. Here's where we really see a shift in household structure. So if we look at the very far right under totals, we see that most of the growth between 2020 and 2050 is going to come from households with no children. So that's going to cause some pretty serious or, or large changes in um, transportation patterns in terms of um, trip types and the, the needed housing in the region. Um, if we look at um, more than one adult with children, relatively minimal growth of that type of household. If we look across the bottom, we can also see that there's actually a forecasted decline um, in households headed by 18 to 24. Some of that is really coming from a decrease in household creation because of housing costs that people, um, younger adults stay living with their families or um, move in with more roommates or move back home because they can't afford um, rent. Um, and we see that the biggest chunk of um, household growth is coming in these older, older adult household types. So 65 plus with some additional growth in the 45 to 64 range. Here's another representation of that. We see that the blue line is households with children and it's, it's really flattening out. Um, and then the, um, pink line without children is going to continue to rise. So most of the household growth in this region is, is going to come from households without children. And one more way to see that uh, variation, this green box at the top is the 65 plus, and that's where we see there's a large um, proportional increase of this household type. We'll quickly discuss a little bit of what some of this could mean for the region. One is that it's not going to be a massive decrease in population, which is important. There are areas of this country that are, are seeing um, flat or even decreasing population, and they have very different um, problems to face in the Denver region. Um, but it is going to be a lot slower. So we saw that 75% increase in the last 30 years, and we're looking at 25% increase in population for the next 30 years. And the Denver region and Colorado are going to continue to see population growth faster than the national average. So um, in general, we're going to continue to be um, moving relatively quickly compared to um, our peers. Um, the Denver region will see no growth in children over the next three decades. So all of the um, issues facing a lot of the schools in the region, that's going to continue. It's also not um, uniform across the region. So some portions of the Denver region 
are going to see um, slight increases in number of children. Others are going to see um, decreases. Uh, we're going to continue to see fast growth among older adults. Um, the 65 plus population is going to be growing seven times faster than the under 65 population. And most of the forecast that household growth is going to be coming from older adults and households without children. Um, this is going to cause a lot of changes in demand for uh, both housing and um, transportation around the region. Um, older adults have different transportation needs. Um, it's also going to change some of the um, kind of macro level employment around the region as more uh, people are working in service sectors such as um, home care and uh, medical fields. Um, it's still unclear at this point how all of that will play out because we really don't know um, how long older adults will continue to work. Um, are they going to continue to stay in their homes? Are they going to going to move to downsized homes? A lot of that will depend on the housing stock and the continued change in housing prices in the region. Are there any questions? Williams. Not really a question, it's more of a statement. I, I just want everybody in the room to realize that this discussion is happening around the world. Um, it, I just listened to a report on it's a huge issue in China. Um, and so we are not abnormal, um, sort of the alternative to people not getting older, which is not what we want. And uh, hopefully with this group, in general, we are beginning to look at what we need to do to support our fastest growing population. That's Rex. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The microphone. And you're right, I know. I think I get it straight <laughs> after 10 years. But um, thank you, Zach, very much. And I mean, it's, it's data that just slaps you in the face, right, about who we are and where we're headed, right? It's not good or bad. It's just different. And uh, it's interesting because we've engaged, we've engaged the board in a conversation about housing um, as it relates to transportation and land use. And um, we've had good dialogue thus far. And we have interest at Dr. Cog in um, developing a regional housing strategy for the region. Um, it's a little different tact than maybe, you know, there's an immediate crisis right now, right? And there seems to be a lot of work that are, that, uh, that's an effort that's going into that. But we see, because of our nexus with transportation, that this is a, an opportunity for us to look ahead, right? In some future year, 2050, for example, are we prepared as a region to accept this data, right? The change in households, the change in the, in the age cohorts that we're expecting the growth in. And I'm not necessarily sure that's true. So we, I think what we're hoping to do with the board is, is continue that conversation and look at ways that we can, we can help accommodate us in our Metro Vision planning and the like, we've, uh, we've identified over 100 urban centers in this region that are ripe for this type of development. And with the hope and desire that we can, you know, create these centers that, um, uh, that are mixed use in nature um, so that older adults, for example, can age in place and still have access to resources and services. So we're, we're encouraged and excited about this opportunity. You'll hear more about this as we move forward because we definitely want to keep the Regional Transportation Committee involved in these conversations. So, Zach, thank you, sir, for the, for the smack in the face. And, and just one final comment would be that all of the demography office forecasts are based around uh, macro models in terms of employment. So a lot of this growth has baked in a relatively rosy picture of the region. So we can't necessarily sit back and expect all of this growth to happen. Um, in, improved development, improved infrastructure, um, the desirability of the region um, is still necessary to bring this um, growth here. Commissioner Stanton. Thank you. Um, Zach, great brief. I want to talk about the over 65 cohort. And <laughs> specifically, I want to talk about safety and economics. And I want to give you uh, direct uh, data 
from people around me, seniors who I'm with, who no longer come to Denver, Mr. Rex. They are afraid. They don't want to ride transit. Well, obviously, you were working on the unhoused population and that, but that is spread. So you're having people who are also afraid of road rage, distracted driving, I-25, accidents this morning on the way in. I'm afraid to drive in here, okay? I'm an airline pilot, Navy pilot with 15,000 hours, and I'm into risk reduction. And one of the ways is not to come to Denver, and it's not just me. So please factor this in. And I know we tend to think, well, you know, this isn't the, it's happening. Denver's not looking good. We need to work together on that. And I think you need to especially go out and talk to senior citizens, double down on it, talk to the poorest among us and find out what their issues are. But I think Houston, Denver, we have a problem. Dr. Cog, we have a problem. Dr. Williams. Is it working? Yay. Yes, um, I do this every meeting. I get it by the end <laughs> of the meeting. Um, I also th thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Older adult, we don't say seniors or senior citizens anymore. We say older adults, and when we're looking at equity and inclusion, we need to look at um, the fact that the older adult population is discriminated against. Age discrimination is, is very, very real. And so when we are planning for all of those types of uh, diversity and inclusion and equity, we want to be sure that we include older adults in that planning. Thank you. Me too. I want to be included. And I'll make a comment on that too. And, and if, I, if I misspeak, I apologize. But I, I think there's a population that grew up knowing the traffic rules, having, having had driver's education, having traffic and driving very structured, and the rules change. <laughs> and I know a lot of seniors have challenges with the flashing yellows and the, the, the turn signals coming at different parts of the cycle. And, and I think driving has become different. And I think, I hope traffic planners think about that and think about the aging population and think about balancing those changes to help with the flow and also messing with people's minds in terms of, of the structure of driving. Just to follow up to what you said, our generation stop for yellow lights. If you stop at a yellow light where I live, you get rear-ended. That is a problem. Fair enough. Sir, Mr. Broom. Not sure on this. Yeah, you are, actually. You are, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, on, on the way, I hadn't noticed. We've lost and all of the community Alton area pushing all of the RTD right away. All ending up. Not a pretty sight to light rail now. I don't know what the as far as the question about, I personally think families suffer than I ran out of the top. But anyway, Something's got to be homeless. And obviously, they've got house somewhere. Yes, there's some work going on along those lines, but it's top in the bucket compared to the out there. And Thank you. Any other questions? Sure, yes. Hi, um, Zach. Do you know if in the data there is um, a scenario for climate migration? 
that's another factor that is going to happen because we're a desirable area from a climate perspective, and we will be. Um, the coastal um, communities, when we see in a 50, 100 years, I mean, this is long term, will be impacted, you know, in a greater way. The southern states, you can see with the increased hurricanes, you, you know, people are going to move and they'll be forced to move. And, and this is an attractive area. Do you know if there's any sort of um, data on that in the uh, analysis? So the demography office doesn't ex- explicitly account for that. Um, some of that's going to end up in um, some of the Moody's forecasts, which are used by the demography office. Um, but there are definitely other forecasts available um, that speak to that. Colorado's probably somewhat in the middle, not quite as uh, well off for climate change as some of the northern states, but compared to um, other areas, it's um, still in a better position. And and I would add, in terms of the discussion around um, the increasing um, older adult population, that Dr. Cog is well positioned on this because the area agents that an agent is part of the um, part of Dr. Cog, and that's not necessarily the norm. So we we have next door to us in in our offices um, 75 people that work in this daily. So that that really does help us. Uh, We have kind of in-house, on-the-ground um, expertise on this. Zach, thank you very much. Great presentation. Very, very uh, good information. Move on to administ- administrative items. Uh, report from CDOT. I just want to say today... I feel like um, somebody's missing, and the person is Rebecca White. She was a giant. She was a diplomat. She led for so many years, and... Um, I learned so much from her, and uh, we're really fortunate to have Darius Pakbaz, who was her right-hand man throughout. Thank you for being here, and also appreciated William Johnson's overview, because this week, tomorrow, if you tune in to the workshop, we'll be talking about how to get our rural interstate pavement below 3.9%, because we're on the bad list, along with Louisiana and some other states. And we're going to do something about it. Turn it over to Commissioner Hogan. Thank you. So just do a quick update that on um, on January 30th, we held a people-centered streets workshop, design lab. And so Ron was able to join us, and we had a lot of fun trying to figure out the challenge of the intersection on Colorado, Leedsdale, uh, Bayod, and trying to figure out how to improve crossings for uh, pedestrians, how to the connectivity of the bike route and uh, without increasing commuting times. And so it was a very interesting, more than anything, uh, a practice to try to figure out how do we do it and how do we do it with very limited funds. And so um, the CDOT hosted with staff along with uh, our partners, uh, MPOs, um, uh, city leaders, um, and just thinking about how do we start to think about, how do we continue to think about people-centered approach? And so it was a really good conversation. Um, not sure if uh, we discussed the equity program, Central 70 equity program here, but we had an, an, another update of the Central Equity Program and how to ensure that those who bore the, the difficult challenges of Central 70, the masterpiece that we now have, um, actually benefit from it. So, Jessica, was there anything else? Uh, yes, I was going to go ahead and do just an update for CDOT Region 1. Uh, we've got some weather coming in tonight, so our plow drivers are ready to hit the ground again. So if you don't need to travel, be careful traveling. Drive slow. Give yourself extra time because your travel reliability will decrease. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, we've also had some really big success. We've had some innovative um incentives for hiring our maintenance workers, including CDL drivers, which has become a big challenge um, in the last few years. So good news, we are on the decrease in um, vacancies in Region 1 for our maintainers, the professional maintainers, and we're really excited about that. Some of our programs are seeing some really good benefits 
um, with increased applications. Other things going on in Region 1, we are standing up our bus and rapid transit team under Angie Drum. We have now hired a bus and rapid transit um, manager who will be kind of doing the day-to-day boots on the ground production. And then we're working on recruiting some additional staff members for BRT. So really excited there more to come on that program. We're also moving forward uh, rapidly with the segment two of I-25, which is US 36 to 104th and really looking to uh, be ingenuitive in what we can figure out to reduce the crashes that we're seeing really support transit in that corridor as well as freight. So more to come on that in the year ahead, but lots of exciting things happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. See that report. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good. I want to hear it again. <laughs> RT, I apologize. Wait, I RTD. felt like it was Groundhog Day. I was like, did I miss something? <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll start off and then yield the floor um, uh, to others representing RTD. But I wanted to share um, the latter part of January, January 31st, and on February 1st, RTD in conjunction with its partners up in the northwest part of the region held two uh, informational public houses as it relates to the Northwest Rail Peak Study Feasibility, well, Peak Service Feasibility Study. And I have to tell you, it was very, very well attended. Oftentimes, you know, one goes to a public um, meeting and staff outnumbers those in attendance. And I have to tell you, uh, from all accounts, I wasn't physically there because we had a board meeting the same night on January 31st, but we had in excess of like 100 people there on both nights. And I heard some great feedback from our jurisdictional partners that they thought it was well attended. So as we work uh, collectively to get a common set of facts, as we, you know, decide a path forward. Um, another project that I'd like to mention is our fair study and equity analysis. Perhaps you saw some media coverage last week as we've been working uh, diligently, um, focused on a myriad of different uh, stakeholder groups, equity populations, um, stakeholders as well, and what's going to happen tomorrow at our Finance and Planning Committee of the RTD Board of Directors. Uh, staff, we're going to present to them an update on where we are with the various options for the proposed draft um, for the proposed draft fair structure. And there is a couple of things that'll happen, so it's not a fait accompli as of yet. So we're going to garner feedback from our board of directors that'll take place going through March. And then April will be seeking uh, guidance from the board to release those um, proposals to the public. And it's planned in May that we will do a equity analysis to discern our path forward as it, as it aligns with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then basically bring something forward for the board's consideration in June. So we're really excited about it in the sense that we really have undertaken a massive engagement process, uh, leveraging different populations that often don't have a voice at the table we use the 21 safe harbor languages, partnering with community-based organizations. And so that is something in and of itself. Um, I would also like to state that on Wednesday, our illustrious chair of that committee is sitting right across from me, Director Kate Williams for Operations and Safety Committee. And during the course of that uh, meeting, we will be talking about our code of conduct. There's been a lot of media coverage as it relates to that. And I've gotten questions like, are we seeking legislative relief. No, what we're trying to do holistically is create a safe and welcoming transit environment. Director Broom just spoke to uh, individuals um, that are seeking you know, refuge in public spaces. We are not trying to discriminate against any population whatsoever. I think as we clearly see oftentimes people um, that basically are unhoused or may be suffering the ills of society as a whole, you know, seek uh, places where they feel comfortable, and that's often in public right away. So we are not alone in this, um, and we have been working diligently with a myriad of different um, entities, um, and also our chief of police will be providing an update on activities relative to uh, community policing. And I use the term in a soft way, but it's basically to create relationships and, and become accustomed with those that are in our system and then steer them towards services. And that's what we've been trying to do. As you know, we have a mental health care clinician, clinician. It's just one individual, but we pride ourselves on being professionals and delivering transit services. And um, we need to ensure that we're working in partnership with those that have the subject 
subject matter expertise and the clinical backgrounds to provide those types of services. So that's what we're endeavoring to do. So I just wanted to take this opportunity um, and clear that up because I've had a myriad of different questions come my way. So with that, I will yield the floor, ask Mr. Welch, Director Broom, uh, Director Williams, if they have anything additionally. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, CEO Johnson, I was wondering if you wanted to give two other quick updates. One was DTP versus RTD, and the other is the uh, Zero Emission Fleet Transition Plan. Well, recognizing, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Welch. As it relates to the Denver Transit Partners who provide uh, services for our, our commuter rail lines, there are concessionaire. Uh, there was an impending uh, litigation, there was a lawsuit that has been in place since 2018 and received the judge's ruling on Friday. Our general counsel is delving through that at this juncture, so that's what I will say. But for all intents and purposes, we have been uh, indicated um, as we go forward. And a uh, fleet transition plan, um, I will share that we are working diligently uh, within the staff ranks. There is a zero admission ad hoc um, committee upon which uh, Director Williams is a member. Um, and we are committed to forging ahead, seeking out alternative fuel options um, for us to be eligible for some monies that have come through the bipartisan infrastructure law with the increase being low and no zero emissions funding, we have to ensure that we have a zero emission uh, transition plan holistically. And oftentimes a lot of people have gone forward without having that. And um, it's something that's near and dear to our hearts because we have to ensure that not only do we have the adequate facilities, but this is a whole different business model. Um, it's not just about procuring a bus. It's about how we do business. It's about how we do our route scheduling, which will be a lot different. We have the workforce component, and needless to say, our youngest bus facility is probably 36 years old. So it goes part and parcel with all of that. So uh, that's something that we're endeavoring to do and actually have a meeting just later this afternoon and would like to bring something to the board's consideration as we look at a scope uh, to seek consulting services. So thank you very much, Mr. Welch, for uh, broaching that. The only input that I have on all that is that we are asking that anybody who's interested, our committee meetings are open to the public um, as our boss said tonight is the finance um, committee meeting and it starts at 5.30 and you can find it online and tomorrow night is the operations and safety committee meeting that we would love to have um, anybody join. We have a, a three-minute public participation platform, so if you have something that you want to bring to that meeting, we would love to hear it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Regional air quality. I actually, to be fair, I should call on RTD again, <laughs> just so, so that I'm being I'm being equal. But uh, regional air quality, Mr. Silverstein. Well, the the acronyms are almost interchangeable. So, <laughs> kind of. Anyway, um, just a, something short here. Um, at the Regional Air Quality Council, we are kicking off our lawn and garden um, electrification initiative. And um, this is a program, it's, it has two prongs. One is a incentive-based program, which is uh, a little over a million dollars and hopefully to grow um, to local governments, um, anybody who is out there in the public sector, school districts, transit agencies, state agencies that need um, to go electric in their lawn and garden fleet. Um, our grant um, process will begin in March. And so please spread the word in your, um, in your jurisdictions that um, we have money to give away if, as long as uh, gas-powered equipment is recycled at the same time um, to make a dent in our, um, in our emissions um, from this sector. And then the, um, you know, as this incentivizes the move to electric, we're also going to be considering uh, regulatory initiatives, um, whether it's um, in the future, um, uh, no gas-powered equipment to be sold in our, in our non-attainment area going forward, and summertime use restrictions of gas-powered equipment. 
So in, in other words, you got to mow the lawn, you better use, ele- you have to use electric. So all of this is, is being developed for consideration by the board and then uh, possibly the, um, the state for, um, for rulemaking uh, later this year. So that's our latest initiative at the Regional Air Quality Council, and we would appreciate everybody's participation in our work groups and stakeholder processes as we develop these programs. Michael, is that going to include gas grills? We are, nobody's going into anyone's backyard. <laughs> yeah. And this wouldn't be a, a residential, in the restrictive area, it wouldn't be a residential program. It would be in the public sector and the commercial sector uh, use, because that's where the majority of the, the use of, of gas-powered equipment occurs and the emissions that result. Michael, are you still doing the program where residential users can trade in their I took advantage of that a number of years ago. Phenomenal program. Can you mention it just briefly? Sure. That's that's what we call that's the residential incentive piece that's longstanding called mow down pollution, and that's where you bring in your um, old gas powered um, device to a, either an event or um, to a metal recycler, get a voucher, a receipt, and then you get a discount on new electric equipment. And so we do that. No, no, no grill still. Um, so we'll do, we'll initiate that program again. We have a budget of about uh, $200,000 this year for residents. That's about 1,500 vouchers. And we also will be expanding it to um, uh, small equipment too, blowers, trimmers, um, all of that as well. So um, that program is, it's, it's only as good as the funding and all of these programs are. We need tens of millions of dollars to, make, to really eliminate this category as, as all categories. It's, it's all expensive. But um, this is a start, and we want everyone to participate. It's a, a great program, as are many of the things you do, all of the things you do. Thank you, everybody. Uh, great conversation. I appreciate the, the references to equity and, and those issues throughout a lot of these conversations. appreciate the staff presentations. Uh, Cam is the most popular person in the room right now, and that if you park downstairs, he has the voucher to get you out for free. So see Cam for that. With that, our next meeting is uh, Tuesday morning, March 14th. We'll see you then. Meeting adjourned.